Um, Cynthia Jordan, I'm sure doesn't need much of an introduction. You all know her. But uh, she's a dear sister in Christ who warms those around her with the love of Christ. I think Cynthia is the most generous and cheerful giver I've ever known. If you have ever been a guest in her home, you will know that she is given to much hospitality. Cynthia's hands are never idle. She labors tirelessly in the Lord alongside her husband, Richard, for the work of the ministry. And Cynthia, we thank the Lord for his work in your life, and we look forward to the teaching that you will bring from his word today. Okay, John, thank you. Now you made me tear up, so that was not good. Uh-huh. I'm under strict instructions not to make anybody cry, much less me. Uh, uh, thank you, ladies, for coming and spending the afternoon here and to hear me. I will tell you, you are not getting my husband. You're getting me. So I uh, hope you're not too disappointed, but, you know, God's word is really never disappointing. So um, we're going to open up with a word of prayer so I can calm down a little bit. <laughs> so Jean did this last year, and she said her knees were knocking. Oh, <laughs> the heart's beating up here, and the knees are knocking. So, <laughs> Okay, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today bowing our heads and our hearts in thankfulness. Lord, thankfulness for your word, thankfulness for the ability that we have to still come in this country and open your word and study it openly. Um, we just uh, thank you, Lord, for the most precious gift that was ever given, and that's the gift of our salvation. We thank you for leaving heaven's glory and coming down here to a sinful creation and taking on the form of a man and going to Calvary's cross and dying there and paying for our sins. Lord, there's just no greater gift than we could have ever imagined to have. Now, we just pray as we go on and we open your word that we'll just hold fast to the faithful word that you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, and I was thinking about what to teach today, and I kind of wanted to stick to the theme so that, um, you know, it kind of went together. And um, I um, thought, you know, how to teach to you how to hold fast the faithful word as women. And, um, you know, as we go about our daily lives, things happen, and you have troubles up and down. You have good days. You have bad days. So we're going to start today in Titus 1.9. That's the verse that most of the preachers have been um, uh, talking about this, this weekend. Okay, Titus 1, nine, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Um, what is holding fast? And you want to look at the gainsayers right there too. The gainsayers are those that deny, contradict, or dispute the doctrine. And you want to be able to hold fast and to be able to um, convince them that they're wrong and that God's word is right. And that's what we as women need to be able to do in our lives. Um, I kind of looked up what holding fast meant. And, of course, it's two words. So this is what I came up with. Holding fast is something to which something else may be firmly secured. Stick to firmly to firmly remain in the same position or keep the same opinion, to bear down and stay the course. And uh, if you turn over to 2 Timothy 1.13, that's the other verse that's been um, used this weekend. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now, ladies, we need to know God's word. We need to hide it in our hearts. We need to let it work in our lives every single day of our lives. And that takes studying it, rightly divided, and putting it in there. You can't let it sit on the counter. It, you can't absorb it by osmosis. You have to read it, and you have to study it. It just won't get there any other way. So um, what I want to do first 
And this is exciting to me. I hope it's exciting to you. My husband has a uh, DVD or a tape back there, and I forgot to ask the name of it, but there's a whole bunch of this stuff on that DVD, and I'll find out if you really want to know. But what I want to look at is show you some relevance of God's Word in your life. And we're going to start by turning to Psalms 139. And if you heard my husband, if you listened to him, you probably heard this because he taught this in Ephesians. So I'm not going to teach his message, but there's some of this stuff that's just really exciting. Okay, Psalms 139. I've got to get there, too. Okay, I'm still shaking, ladies. Um, verse 15 and 16. <laughs> okay, deep breath, yeah. Uh, David is speaking here, and he says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in, the, in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, doesn't say imperfect, it says unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in countenance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. This is David in the womb, before he was perfect little baby born. This is, there's a book. And in that book is written your book of DNA. That's how close God's word is to you. There's a book of your DNA written at your conception. And God's word tells you about it. You are who you are when you're conceived. I'm sorry, you're not a fetus. You're a person. You're an individual. And everything about you is there. It says unperfect just because you're not fully formed and born yet. Um, it says all my members were written. Everything about you is written at conception. And it's your book of DNA. God wrote that book of DNA. He also wrote another book. And this book contains your spiritual DNA. The life of your spiritual DNA. And this is where you're going to find out who you are in Christ. And everything about you is written in this book, Your Spiritual Life. Okay, now let's look at some things about the Bible with that in your mind. And I'm going to relate them to your body. Um, and it's sort of like my husband says, this is commercial, but it's not really commercial. So, Okay, think about your spine. There are 33 bones in your spine. Divide your body in half. And you, you've got this right and left side. Okay. In the scripture, the Bible has several different two parts. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament, two parts. The spine divides you. Okay. There's prophecy and mystery, two parts. That's the only two parts in there, prophecy and mystery. There's 66 books. When you divide them in half, that's 33, 33. 33 bones in your spine. All right, now, turn to Psalms 117. Uh, Psalms, okay. There are 1,189 chapters in your Bible. Psalms 117 is the middle chapter. Look at that, and we're going to read it. How many verses are in that chapter? Two. Two. So your spine divides, 33 bones divide you in half. That, 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 those, that chapter has two, ver two parts. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Where does the truth of the Lord endure? In his word. Forever. Count the words in those two verses. There's exactly 33 words in those two verses. If you do not have a King James Bible, you do not have 33 words in those two verses in that chapter. The issue of the Bible is a very important one. Okay? Now, just think about that. 33 words in that middle chapter of your Bible. 
Okay, your face. How many know how many bones are in your face? 22. Turn to Revelation chapter 22. And I hope this is fun. It's fun to me, although I'm still shaking. So. Revelation chapter 22. I, you know, I want you to get this. So, and it's, it's not heavy, it's light, but it's fun, ladies, to see what's in God's Word. Revelation chapter 22. Look at verses 3 and 4. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall... Wait a minute, I didn't read that right. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. In Revelation chapter 22, and the 22 bones in your face, whose face shall they see? Christ. Just a little bit of, you know, coincidence there, maybe. So, okay. Now turn to 1 Peter 1.23. 1 My husband was teaching this, and I'm like, that is so exciting. I like people, you know. Okay. Um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 23. No, 1 Peter 1. Thank you. I'm... Um, no, no, no. First Peter 1, 23. Okay. Now, we're not born again. This is Israel, but listen to this. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. First Peter 1, 23. Okay. Here, the issue is the word of God, and it's a seed. It's, re it's compared to a seed. In a plant seed, the DNA is contained in the seed of a plant. The scripture contains our DNA, our spiritual DNA. Um, in the seed are the cells. So we're going to talk just a little bit about your cells. Okay. Each person, you've got cells. Each cell has how many chromosomes? 46. Each cell has 46 chromosomes. You get 23 from your father and 23 from your mother. When those come together, you are who you are. Okay. Um, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Let me find it. Okay, go to verses um, 23 and 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they are both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Okay, one flesh. Um, Look at, uh, wait a minute, hold on. Oh, no, 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 I, I didn't read 23. I wrote, read, the, read the wrong ones. Oh, okay, go back to 23. This, okay, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of me, of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, this is what I wanted to say to you. If you start at the word this and count, there are exactly 46 words in those two verses. You have 46 chromosomes in a cell. Not a coincidence, ladies. Okay, now go down to chapter... Um, Three, and this is where Satan's tempted Eve, and of course Eve did what? Changed the word of God, added to it, left a little bit out, fixed it the way she needed it fixed to get what she wanted. But if you look in all three, in verse one, and verse four, and verse five, if you start um, with the yea hath God said, 
Look at that. Okay, let's just read it. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. If you go to verse 4, and it says, And the, woman, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. If you count the words Satan spoke to Eve, there are exactly 46 of them in those three verses. If you do verse 1, start with the yea, verse 4, start with the ye, and the whole of verse 5. Those are exactly the words he spoke to, to Eve, and there's 46 of them. It's really amazing to me how connected this word is to us. Okay, the 46th book in the Bible is 1 Corinthians, so go to 1 Corinthians. Where did you find it? And go to chapter 6. Okay, this is the 46th book of the Bible. Okay, um, look at verse on, hold on, let me make sure, 19. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Ladies, we're bought with a price, and I probably need to stop right now. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, he paid a tremendous price for our salvation. He gave his life for us. He died on Calvary's cross to pay for our sins. You need to trust him today if you've not done that because you're bought with a price. And because you're bought with a price, verse 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, this is one of the instances where we find hear about our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost. So let's look at temples that were built. Okay, Moses built a tabernacle in the wilderness. And the walls of that tabernacle had 20 panels on this side, 20 panels on that side, added up, six across the back. 46 panels surrounded that, temp that tabernacle. 46 chromosomes in your DNA. Okay. Now, uh, Solomon built a temple. And at the entrance to that temple, he had two pillars going up. Each pillar was 23 cubits high. 23 and 23 makes 46. Okay. Um, Herod built a temple. And if you look in John 2, verse 20, Herod's temple that he built took 46 years to build. All right. And something else, have you ever seen the DNA strand swirling? Okay. In the middle of Solomon's temple is a spiral staircase that swirls. Okay, and that's in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, if you want to check it out. Okay, ladies, the point of all of this is how powerful and how relevant God's word is to us. It needs to affect your life. It can and it, and it will. It won't affect it if you don't put it in, rightly divide it. You can't live it till it's there. Okay, so hold fast God's word. We need to hold fast the faithful word. We need to do it all the time. So now what I wanted to talk about is a little bit about us and things in our life. Now, question, and you don't have to answer me. Please don't answer me. <laughs> like, um, how many of you have absolutely no trouble going on in your life right now? Everything's just peachy. <laughs> Everything's coming up in roses. 
Okay, ladies, I can't answer them. I can't hand, you know, raise my hand. So, and I don't want you to, but you don't have to do that. I just want you to think about. Sometimes we want to say, Lord, stop this dispensation. Come down here, fix this, you know. And then you can go back to the, you know, to the body of Christ and grace. You know, just fix it right now. You're impatient. But in God's word is the peace and the comfort that you need to get you through troubles in your life. Which leads me to say trouble in your life. Suffering and trouble comes from three places. It comes from life. There's, we live in a sin-cursed creation. It's not going to work right. There's death, there's sickness, there's accidents, there's just natural disasters. You guys get hurricanes, we get snowstorms, you know, blizzards and all that stuff. California gets earthquakes, life. And you get, they're just things that are going to happen. Wrong decisions is the second place that you make in your life. You are not studying God's word. You're not hiding it in your heart. You're just doing some dumb, stupid thinking, and you're in sin, and you're saying, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's just, I'm going to do it this way. You're just living in sin willfully. That's the first way is life. Second way is wrong decision making. I want to say something right here, ladies. God Almighty is not putting on you the consequences to sin in your life or life in general. If you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, when the Good Samaritan came by, there's two little words in that passage that says, by chance. Life happens by chance. God Almighty is not punishing you for things that are going on in your life, whether they are wrong decisions by you or it's just life. Just had a phone call from a man from Australia, and he's telling me how God's punishing these people, this pastor friend, was trying to take his money, apparently, according to him. And he went to court, got it stopped. But he says, you know, that man's brother is sick and his nephew got burned. God's punished him because they were opposing me. I'm like, Where, did you hear what you just said? Do you mean to tell me that Christ dying on that cross did not pay for that man's sins? That he's punishing more? I said, you don't believe that. And by the way, why would he punish his brother and his nephew and not him? <laughs> Didn't make a lot of sense. But ladies, the consequences of sin in your life, the consequences of life are just that. God Almighty is not punishing you for things going on in your life. He died on the cross to pay for those things. Don't let somebody tell you that. And don't be the one that tells somebody else that. Because life is life. Wrong decision-making is wrong decision-making. Now, the third way that suffering comes or trouble comes in your life is the ministry. How many of you got saved, trusted the Lord, you are so excited, you run out and you start telling everybody you know that Christ died on the cross to pay for their sins, you got to believe this, look at this, and all of a sudden the number of your friends starts diminishing. Not too many of them. And then you go try to tell your family, and what happens? You're crazy. And then you learn to rightly divide it, and you learn grace, and then they really think you have stepped off into another world, another dimension, and you are in the cult. We were in a nudist colony when we were in Alabama. We were a cult. I mean, you know, it's all kinds of things that people say are going on around you. And we're like, what? You know? But... Ministry causes suffering. And, I mean, my husband goes through people talk about, I don't even know because he won't tell me. And I don't need to know. You know why? Because you just go on with your daily ministry and you forget all the stuff because it's just stuff. Okay, so just tuck that in the back of your mind. Three ways trouble comes in your life. Because I want to talk about two women, especially in the Bible, real quick who had God's word and they knew it and they understand it. And you know these women. It's just a refresher. Um, okay, turn to Genesis chapter 15. Let's 
see if I can do this right. Okay, the first woman I want to talk to you about is Jochebed. Do you know who Jochebed was? Moses' mother. Okay, now I want to read these two verses first so that you understand what's going on here. Genesis 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. So Israel's in slavery for 400 years. Now look at verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. In other words, it wasn't time yet. The 400 years were not over yet. But in that fourth generation, a deliverer was coming. Now, if you look at uh, Exodus chapter 6, to show you the fourth generation here. Okay, if you look at Exodus chapter 6, verse 16, and these are the names of the sons of Levi. So Levi's the first generation. According to their generations, the sons are Gershon, Kohath, and Moriah. Okay? Look at verse 18. So I'm looking at Kohath, and that's what I'm calling his name. It could be said differently. but Now look at verse 18. And the sons of Kohath, Amran and Ishar and Hebron. We're going to look at Amran. He's the third generation. Now look at verse 20. And Amran took to him Jochebed, his father's sister's to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. Moses is the fourth generation. Jochebed knew the word of God to her. She knew Moses. Now look at Exodus chapter 1. And you know the story of Moses. Um, okay. If you look in verse uh, 16, 17, Pharaoh, the Egyptian children, the Isra Israelite children, there's too many of them. Pharaoh's not happy. He looks at it like they're going to take over. There's more of them than there are of us. So he has in those 16, 17, 18, he has the midwives, and he's telling the midwives, kill, when you go into the Israelite woman and it's a boy born, you kill it. Well, if you read on, they said, no, we're not doing that. Now, I don't know what kind of punishment they got for saying no, but they refused to do that. Um, then, if you look in chapter 2, verse 1, um, it says, Levi took the wife, a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Jochebed knew that fourth generation had a deliverer. She hid Moses. For, now, do you know how hard? She had adversity in her life. She was under bondage, under slavery. She had a son. She had to hide him. Do you, how hard it is to hide a three-month-old baby and nobody know? that that baby's not there? <laughs> Ask this mother right over here. You know, she's sitting in the back, and you know she's just nervous as she can be. The baby's crying. i got to take her out. Well, well, little girls got to live, so she would have been okay. Little boys didn't get to live. So because Pharaoh then, he just ordered an edict. Whenever anybody saw a male child, Israeli child, Israelite child, they had to be thrown in the river. Jochebed took a chance. She hit him. Her and Miriam made the basket, put him in the bulrushes. Pharaoh's daughter um, found him. He survived and became the physical deliverer of Israel. Jochebed was the mother of the physical deliverer of Israel. Okay? She knew God's word to her. She didn't have a lot of it written down. She had some, but she knew that that deliverer was coming and Moses was the fourth generation. Okay, now let's look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, which we've just come through Christmas. Turn to, where do I want to turn to? Luke. And you know all this, but it's just a reminder of things in your life. Okay, 
Um, now, here we are, is Mary, a virgin. And if you look in verse 26, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind, What manner of salutation should this be? This should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Okay. Um, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Look down now, and you know, he's telling her what is going to happen with Jesus. Okay, look down to verse 38. This is what I want you to see. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. She didn't say, Oh no, Lord, not me. The angel Gabriel explained to her what was going on, and her response was, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. She accepted. Now, all right, ladies, she is pregnant in a society that says she was to be put away. And if you go back and look in Matthew 1, verse 19 and 20, the angel goes to Joseph and tells Joseph that the woman that you're espoused to is going to have a child. And he, in his mind, he's like, I'll just put her away and everything. And, he, and the angel said, no, marry her, but don't know her until this baby's born. Joseph did what was right and listened to the angel of the Lord. He, by all rights, could have done what they required to be done. So do you think Mary, according to the world out there, was in good standing? I don't think so. So she had some diversity in her life to, tend to, to deal with. Uh, but if you look over in verse 46... She's gone to see Elizabeth, and they've met, and she says, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. She's in a pickle, but her soul magnified the Lord. She knew God's word. Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was Israel's true deliverer, Jochebed was Israel's mother of Israel's physical deliverer. Mary was the mother of Israel's true deliverer. Okay, now, these are just two examples. You can think of more. I really wanted to talk about Bathsheba, but it's like not enough time. But if you think about that and what Bathsheba and David did, their sin of adultery, then sin of murder. And if you read Proverbs 31, the first verse says to King Lemuel, out of the mouth of your mother, something like that. He is reciting to you what his mother Bathsheba told him to look for in a woman, not what she was, but what she, should, she was then. She knew something about the word of the Lord. You study through that, because Bathsheba was in just as much wrong in that adulterous thing as David was. She really was. So... Now, okay, turn to Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke. All right, I want to show you uh, here, and I'm not picking on the men, but this is some men. Okay, I'm not picking on them. Okay, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And I'm getting close, ladies. Okay, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. I'm going to read this, and I want you to just listen to it. And, and we're going to go to verse uh, 41, to the end of the chapter. And the same day when even was come, now let me set this up. Jesus had been teaching the disciples, speaking parables. The multitudes have come. They're tired. And he speaks to the disciples. 
Uh, and the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over to the other side. And that's the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even, with, even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. So there's a bunch of ships on the sea. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and, the, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now let's look at that passage for just a minute. Okay, first one. Ladies, if Jesus says we're going to pass to the other side, don't you think you're going to get to the other side safely? But they didn't believe the word spoken out of his mouth. They didn't believe him. They knew who he was, but they did not believe his word. They're fearful and they're afraid. Uh, and then look at verse 39. And he said, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. He just spoke his word and peace came. God's word will bring peace in your life. Okay, did they trust his word? No, they didn't. They learned to eventually. They feared and they had no faith in his word. And yet they marveled at him. But God's word brings peace and comfort in our lives. Now, ladies, we don't have Jesus here to say, come calm the storm, the stormy seas of life. But we do have his word to calm the storms. We do have his word in peaceful times, not just to calm the storms, but we have his word. Okay, do you want peace in your life? Sure we do. Peace. What's peace? Peace is a state. It's a condition of the heart, but it's a state of stillness and serenity, of freedom from agitating anxious thoughts, a condition of harmony. It's a sense of harmony, well-being, and freedom from inner turmoil. So when the trouble comes in your life, no matter where they are, you can have peace in your life about it. Those three ways we talked about trouble coming, suffering coming, you can have peace. So now what I'm going to do for the rest of my message is just read to you. You don't have to look these up. I'll give you the reference. Some things that God's Word says about peace. Okay. John 14, 27 says... Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. There's nothing that can offend and separate you from the love of God. If 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we deny him, he abideth faithful. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always, by all means. The Lord be with you all. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. What are you going to believe in? Ladies, he will give you peace. 
He will activate peace in your heart. He will create peace in your soul through his word. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Peace and comfort comes through Christ Jesus in his word. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule. It is a response of faith. And you all know Romans 10.17 Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Ladies, Peace is not the absence of turmoil. It's the ability to rest in God's word to make us tranquil in the midst of turmoil. Peace comes through God's word working in our inner life, giving us the confidence that we can rest and trust in him. And in closing, I just want to tell you, there's a famous picture Okay, my lazy southern tongue. Not a pitcher of water, a picture. Okay. Um, that is of a mother bird sitting on her nest on a branch, and there's a fierce storm swirling around her. And she's sitting on that nest. She's stayed and she's unmovable, waiting for that storm to pass. There's an old hymn that says, and think about the picture, stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Let's pray. I think I can. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the peace that we can have in your word. And, Lord, I just pray as we leave here today that the ladies will go with an understanding of how precious and how wonderful your word is and how connected and how it is to us, just physically, spiritually, and how important it is for us to study it, rightly divide it, and then to just live it and let it live in our lives even though there are times that are hard, it's so hard sometimes, and you just want to give up and walk away, and you, and you just can't because your word is there, and you are there for us to have peace and comfort in and trust in. And, Lord, we just thank you for the ladies and the testimonies they have here. And we just, I pray that they just go with a better understanding of how wonderful and precious our salvation is and your word is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. I looked down at Stacy and she's crying. <laughs> and she wasn't supposed to do that. So, okay. Now, okay, are you going to take that, turn that off? Is it still going? The tape. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Now, I have something for you. It doesn't need to go on the tape. I want you ladies just to look. I made you all. Okay, I'll show you mine because I really like mine. I made you all bookmarks. And there's three bowls of them. There's all color and shape, and there's plenty for everybody. And I was going to put them on the seats, but I thought then you can't pick and choose. <laughs> so um, it's just, yeah. So. Um, part of the stress in my life. <laughs> 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 I've got my goal sometimes. But anyway, they're in these bowls, and I would really like for you to take them, because I really don't want to take them home. <laughs> Here, Stacy, if you want to pass them. They're all different colors, shapes, sizes. 
You can look through it, take your time. You don't have to take the one on the top. Oh, no, Thank you.
You're welcome. You're welcome, ladies. Oh, that thing's on.